Hello everyone and welcome to this evening's online event. My name is Elvin, Elvin Box, and I am privileged to be the Chair of London Constructing Excellence. So we are delighted that you've been able to join us this evening for a talk that is extremely current and highly relevant with the news just yesterday morning that a major UN scientific report uh, state quite clearly that climate change is at code red for humanity. The talk this evening addresses why assets in the built environment must have a clear net zero carbon strategy and sufficient reductions in operational energy to meet the task force on climate related financial disclosures by 2025. Okay. Now, the talk will commence in the next few minutes with your questions being answered from no later than 6.45 p.m. and our session wrapping at 7 p.m. Please note our hashtag tonight is hashtag LCECNZ. Two key points to raise before we start the presentation. Number one, as you're aware, for presentation purposes, you've all been muted. Please would you be so kind uh, to turn off your cameras as well. As is the norm with our online events, please use the chat facility throughout the presentation for your questions, which will be very, very gratefully received. If you wish people to know you are the author of a question, please ensure your name appears on the question. Thank you. Number two, please be aware that this evening's session is being recorded and will be available on your YouTube channel in the next two days. Now, our guest speaker this evening is Simon Wyatt, who holds the Net Zero Carbon and Sustainable Governance Teams, uh, sorry, heads, uh, sorry, who leads uh, the Net Zero Carbon and Sustainable Governance Teams at global engineering consultancy, Cundall. Simon is an environmental specialist focusing on carbon reduction policy and strategy. He is the author of official policy on embodied and whole life carbon for the Construction Industry Council of Hong Kong, plus the Greater London Authority's New London Plan. Simon is also chair of SIPS's Knowledge Generation Panel and an integral member of an array of industry groups uh, focused on decarbonisation. Very interesting is Simon, Lee. Simon currently uh, writes a regular column for Building Magazine about net zero in the countdown to COP26 series. So unsurprisingly, Simon is recognised as a leading authority on net zero and whole life carbon in the built environment. Tonight, Simon's presentation focuses on three key aspects. Number one, why developers risk being stranded, unable to gain funding, and what the implications are. Number two, what would uh, what we should be looking at now to address this. Three, how might a building digital twin and design for performance help manage operational energy use and reduce carbon? London Construction Excellence are delighted to have such a knowledgeable specialist for your edification and entertainment this evening. So without further ado, it gives me great pleasure to introduce Simon Wyatt. Good evening, all. Thank you for the introduction. Um, as indicated, today we're going to be talking uh, about climate change and the role of the built environment has in responding to that and the issues we face around moving uh, the built environment towards net zero carbon. So I've put together some slides to kind of give you an introduction of why the climate crisis is important, uh, the drivers for change and what we're seeing in the, the current market, which has been very fast moving over the last two years. Uh, looking at the definitions for net zero carbon buildings, uh, which are fairly well defined now. And over the last kind of six months, there's been quite a few projects and initiatives to align all the definitions. So the industry is singing from the same, same hymn sheet and everyone understands uh, net zero carbon to be the same thing. And the two key focuses uh, for, the, for the new buildings and, and existing buildings is net zero carbon in operation, looking at the energy use of the building, and net zero carbon on construction, which is looking at the embodied carbon associated with the materials and the construction, which is growing in importance. And there's extreme lobbying at the moment to try and get that regulated as part of the building regulations. And I'll go through some of the things which are being discussed at the moment in terms of uh, embodied carbon towards the end of the presentation. So just to give you a bit of um, background uh, and understanding where we are, as, as indicated, it's very timely with the IPCC. Uh, reports coming out over the last few days indicating that 
there's basically almost now categoric evidence indicating that uh, climate change is being accelerated by human activity and we have almost reached a tipping point where uh, we could see catastrophic uh, climate breakdown going forward. Um, if we look back at historic uh, CO2 emissions, they've risen uh, since the Industrial Revolution year on year with only a few dips uh, associated with economic recessions and the pandemic, but generally uh, global upward trends. And if we carry on with those global upward trends, even with the current commitments that we've seen from national governments since COP21 uh, uh, back in Paris, uh, we'd be actually achieving a two to three degree uh, rise in temperatures globally, whereas the aspirations of the Paris Agreement uh, aim to limit climate change to two degrees uh, with an aspiration to get it down to 1.5 degrees. And we've seen over the last uh, few years a number of reports and studies showing the significant impact between 1.5 degrees and 2 degrees. Obviously, while we've been talking over the last five years since COP21, uh, the world's actually been warming. and We've actually seen uh, over one degree of warming in the... Um, in, the, in the recent history. And uh, that's led over the last few years to seeing more and more extreme weather events. Uh, we've obviously probably most extreme seen the forest fires in uh, Australia, North America, what's going on in Athens and, and Greece at the moment is, is pretty terrifying uh, and it's starting to have an impact on human life, but also on real estate, property, businesses. Uh, the UK, generally the biggest things we're, worth, we're seeing and being affected by are obviously the increases in flash flooding. We're seeing a lot more intense rainfall. We've obviously had it over the last few weeks. Uh, and if we go back to last year, obviously the heat waves, which are causing uh, increased requirements for comfort cooling and air conditioning, but also causing uh, threats to elderly and vulnerable people in terms of uh, loss of life. So there's significant effects of climate change being realised and all the projections as the IPC indicated yesterday are actually underestimates of where we actually are and we're seeing it actually accelerate much faster than expected. Uh, over the last few years we've really seen people start to respond to it. The response has been slower than liked but it's, it's starting to move in the right direction. Uh, it, before the pandemic, it was probably the number one ag agenda item on the news, and it's carried on a fairly uh, reasonable amount of coverage over the last two years, even with the pandemic. Uh, this is kind of uh, topped off and summarised by, obviously, the Fridays movement, and Greta, uh, she sat outside the Swedish parliament on her own over two years ago, uh, and then a year later, six million people protested globally. We've had the Extinction Rebellion events in the UK. Uh, and in response to that, we've seen responses from government, local authorities, and the UK government actually were at the forefront of this. So they were the first government to declare a climate emergency. And when they declared their climate emergency, they actually changed the Climate Change Act to move to net zero carbon by 2050. The original commitment under the Climate Change Act was an 80% reduction by 2050. And what was happening with that was that a lot of um, industries which were considered to be difficult to decarbonize were kind of hiding in that 20 percent and when you add up everyone that was hiding in the 20 percent and not taking action it came to considerably higher than 20 percent and the committee for climate change indicated that we were we weren't on target to hit the 80 percent reduction so the government moving to a net zero carbon target for 2050 was quite aspirational and forward thinking What's been interesting, though, is since they made that declaration and commitment, uh, a number of local authorities, over 70 percent of them now, have, have declared their own climate emergency and set their own um, net zero carbon requirements. And a lot of them have actually gone much earlier and faster than uh, the uh, central government. London it aims to be net zero carbon by 2040, uh, Manchester 38, uh, I think Bristol's 25. So there's a few councils which have been really ambitious. I think most of them are starting to wake up to the severity of what they've actually signed up to uh, and what they actually need to do. I think the ones who have been 2025 20, might be in for a bit of a shock in, in terms of what they need to do. But all of them have aspirations which are starting to pass down through their planning requirements. But it doesn't just affect new buildings. It affects anything that's operating in their boroughs and constituencies, whether that's private building or public buildings. But where we've probably seen the greatest movement is probably from the private market. 
uh, free from investors, developers and occupiers with uh, most major corporations and organisations setting their own net zero carbon targets and using something called science based targets, which is basically aligning their carbon footprint and budget to the Paris Agreement 1.5 degree scenario. So they're basically working out what their fair share of carbon emissions are and then trying to reduce them absolute without offsets down to 1.5 degrees. And then to go to net zero carbon, they offset the residual. Uh, developers, we've seen pretty much all of the major developers now sign up to either the World Green Building Council or the Building Better Partnerships uh, net zero carbon commitment. That requires them to uh, develop new buildings to be net zero carbon and operate their existing assets at net zero carbon by predetermined dates, mostly around about 2030, so going ahead of the government again. But where we've seen the strongest uh, drivers for change have been from the investment market. There's a real drive from investors to look at their ESG strategies, environmental social governance, uh, with net zero carbon being front and centre. At the moment, they're struggling to quantify it, but they're starting to uh, put in requirements for achieving funding or access to funding. And one of the key drivers is the Task Force for Climate Related Financial Disclosure, which was set up by Mark Carney and the Bank of, Bank of England and has now been endorsed by pretty much all world banks. And it requires organisations to commit um, uh, to report on their commitments to climate mitigation, but also report their risks to climate change. So looking at adaptation strategies and how they deal with the warming climate and, ext and uh, extreme weather events going forward to f safeguard uh, their financial decisions and, and businesses. This is at the moment voluntary, but going forward, it's likely to be uh, mandatory. Pension funds in the UK are required to report against it from the end of this year. So anyone will have to report their, their mitigation and adaptation strategies. Adaptation strategies are mostly done by the insurance companies at the moment and reviewing what is the risk and how they go about reducing those risks, whereas mitigation is looking at how they reduce their carbon footprint. And one of the ways that a lot of organisations are doing that is using things like science based targets or something called CREM, which is a, a financial tool which has come out of the EU, which basically looks at a, a Paris aligned trajectory for real estate. Uh, you can map any asset against it. So it'll basically say where you perform now uh, against a trajectory, which basically says you have to basically make year on year improvements to align to an ultimate end goal of 1.5 degree scenario. So a lot of uh, portfolio owners, uh, pension funds, hedge funds are at the moment are mapping their assets against these trajectories. They're seeing where they perform. Uh, a lot of assets, good performing assets will be below this trajectory now. But over time, if they don't do anything, there will come a point where they will cross that 1.5 trajectory and basically using more carbon than their fair share. And that uh, triggers something called a stranding event, which is basically where the potential of that asset to lose value uh, starts to kick in. And where you have uh, large institutional investors, what they're doing at the moment is when they're buying assets, they'll be looking against these trajectories and using that as part of the valuation process. So they won't want to be buying assets which are above the green line or will pass that green line in the near future. In order to get an asset to move uh, kind of down that trajectory, uh, they're having to look at interventions. So doing retrofit works, uh, renovation, to improve the performance of that building so the stranding event becomes later safeguarding that assets. And where we're talking about green funds, green pension and green investment, what we're looking at is basically investors saying that their assets are below this green line. They are in line with the Paris uh, Agreement and the science and therefore it can be classified as a green investment, which the demand for green investment at the moment is significantly outstripping the supply. So where do buildings uh, and the built environment fit into this discussion? Well, the built environment is generally considered to be responsible in developed nations for about 40% of emissions. So a third of it roughly comes from the building operations, uh, but about just over 10% comes from the actual construction of the buildings in the first place. Uh, what is really important uh, when we talk about the built environment and general carbon reductions is understanding definitions. And as I said earlier, what's happened over the last kind of six months is there's been a number of the uni unification projects to bring together LETI, RIBA, UKGBC and other industry guidance to a unified definition. And one of the key things which we're looking to define at the moment is the difference between carbon neutral. There's a lot of organisations claiming to be carbon neutral these days 
with net zero carbon and absolute zero carbon. And if you want to take the very simplistic view, the, the definition of carbon neutral is where you basically work out your carbon footprint and you buy offsets or removals to remove your carbon footprint. So they could be forestry protection, deforestation, investment in renewables in developing nations, uh, and you can basically remove your carbon footprint. If most people talk about being carbon neutral, that's what they've done. Uh, there's no requirement there to achieve reductions. Whereas net zero carbon, the definition which we're trying to use in the construction industry at the moment and is being written into a lot of standards, uh, including the government are looking at the moment, is to align your emissions to the 1.5 degree scenario before you go to offsets. So this is saying you have to make absolute reductions against all your emissions before you're allowed to remove. So it's saying we can limit climate change to 1.5 degrees without the removals. It's up to you whether you want to go down to zero with your offsets. Uh, so it's more meaningful. So there's less green watch. And there are a few people talking about absolute zero, which is where you, there is no removals allowed. And if you look at the commitments from the construction industry and the World Green Building Council commitment and the BBP commitment, it's all around net zero carbon. One developer alone stands at absolute zero carbon and they've said they're going to be absolute zero carbon for their developments by 2040, which is hugely ambitious. I personally don't really know how they're going to get there. I don't know how you build a building without any carbon emissions associated with the, the products, but it's going to be an interesting journey on how they get there, and I hope they do get there. But the rest of the industry is very much focused around this net zero carbon, which is setting targets to reduce your emissions before moving to offsets. The biggest driver in the built environment is generally come from the World Green Building Council uh, and the UK Green Building Council here. Uh, they've put together a program called Advancing Net Zero, uh, which has outlined a roadmap to net zero carbon, which looks for new buildings to be built uh, to net zero carbon by 2030, with existing buildings by 2050, and starting to consider whole life, and we're including embodied carbon by that 2050. There's a number of documentation uh, that they've produced, which outlines how you go about it, some good case studies, uh, and some good documentation. It's a good starting point for anyone wanting to understand what the requirements are. Uh, the UK GBC have put together a framework uh, for achieving net zero carbon, which is fairly simple and straightforward uh, and really clear. Uh, it lacks detail, but the detail is being added by other organisations like Letty. Uh, UK GBC have actually brought their own documentation out. But there's kind of two major requirements here. It's, it's, it's shown as five, but it, it can be broken into two. The first one is to reduce your construction impact, which is basically looking at the embodied carbon associated with the building, reducing it in line with a target, and then offsetting residual emissions once you've hit that target. Uh, then the second requirement is to reduce your operational energy, which means calculating it in the first instance, which is not something we typically do in the UK. Calculate and predict the energy consumption, reduce it in line with targets in accordance with the uh, 1.5 trajectory and then supply all of that energy from renewable supplies, ideally on site, but where not possible in dense urban environments that can be provided off site through power purchase agreements as long as it adds additionality and is classified as good quality renewable energy. And again, there's documentation out there which explains what that is. And all of this needs public disclosure because transparency is going to be key at the moment. You'll see in the market at the moment, there's a lot of claims around net zero carbon. Uh, some are true and some are just misunderstanding of where they need to go uh, and, and, and not going to the, the full level. So it's still fairly new and anyone actually getting down to these levels is really pioneering at the moment. Uh, we've at uh, Cundle have been involved in writing a number of those uh, documents and guidance, and we've actually put together what we call our own seven steps to net zero carbon, which we use on all new buildings and existing buildings in order to decarbonize them, starting with passive design optimization, energy efficiency, looking to remove fossil fuels, which is easy for new buildings, a bit more difficult for existing buildings, providing renewables, then considering upfront embodied carbon and whole life carbon, which I'll come on to in a bit with the public disclosure as the last step. So I've broken the, the rest of the presentation into kind of two elements. So we'll go through net zero carbon in operation first, which is probably a bit more uh, well known, and then we'll finish up looking at embodied carbon uh, and on construction. So net zero carbon in operation uh, has a new def definition, which has come out from the Whole Life Carbon Network, Letty and RIBA, uh, and it really is very clear in defining what net zero carbon in operation means. It means that the asset will use no fossil fuels. 
it will minimize its energy consumption and meet local energy intensity targets. So those intensity targets come from a number of organizations, which we'll go through in a minute. And then it provides all energy uh, on site or off site from renewables uh, with a demonstrate additionality. Again, all of those have their own requirements. We'll go through in a, in a minute, uh, but they're all very clear and, and, and well defined now. So what do we mean by an energy intensity target? So what what the um, UK Green Building Council and a few other organisations have done is, is kind of look to see how we move to a net zero carbon economy in the UK. And at the moment, we generate about 30% of our energy from renewables. Uh, so in order to basically go to a net zero carbon economy, we need to basically supply uh, all of our energy from renewable or zero carbon sources and get a balance. In order to do that, we need to do two things. We obviously need to increase the amount of renewables, which the government have a plan to do. Uh, they're doubling the capacity over the next decade uh, with significant investment in offshore wind. But at the same time, we need significant reduction on the energy demand on the grid. And if you take all sectors equally, it's about a 60 to 70 percent reduction in energy demand we need to move to a net zero carbon economy with an equitable fair share of energy for everyone. So if you want to simply Paris proof a building and look at a net zero carbon target, if you take the current benchmark performance for that building typology, take uh, 60 percent off that, that will be a good starting point for why you need to get to in terms of your operation energy. At the same time as looking at where we need to get to, uh, an organisation called Letty uh, did some modelling of different building typologies to see what was actually possible. So they took what was considered to be good practice, modelled what they considered to be uh, net zero carbon interventions to see how low they could actually get a building in theory. And they were coming out with very similar results around about 60% reductions. And if you're talking about commercial developments, there's a magic number which a lot of people talk about, which is 55 kilowatt hours per metre squared per year. Uh, as, as that's the key target for operational energy. Just to show that in context, if we look at commercial offices, you can see that the average built environment stock for commercial offices in the UK is actually performing about 300. The best practice kind of 25% are just below 200, and we need to get down to that uh, 55 number, which is extremely uh, challenging. Uh, it won't be achieved by tinkering and small marginal gains. It needs to be significant changes. And one of the key changes is uh, really focusing on the fabric to almost pass it our standards for all building typologies, improving insulation and air tightness levels to reduce energy demand in the first place so we can provide it from uh, more efficient means. What's really important is the calculation and analysis. So this requires us to actually do detailed assessments at design stage to work out what the carbon footprint uh, and energy performance of the building is likely to be. And there are a number of tools for doing this. For, uh, there's basically three main leaders in the market at the moment. If you're doing a fairly simple building, which is heat led, like a residential building, then the passive house standard is probably the most appropriate. A lot of people are using it for schools and demand for passive house over the last two years has really significantly gained. It delivers performance in use uh, and is a really strong standard in terms of buildability and quality of workmanship and, and gets great results. If you're doing a building which is more focused on complex heating and ventilation systems, so like a commercial offices where heating is probably less important, but the mechanical systems are more important then the design for performance standard, which has recently been uh, released, is probably the right way to go. This is a uh, detailed simulation of all the EVAC systems in the building, looking at every hour of the year. So instead of just putting a seasonal efficiency in, you put the efficiency curve of every single piece of equipment into the building, the likely occupants and, and profiles to understand how the building is going to work every hour of the year, not just looking at peak performances. Whereas uh, there's a SIBSI TM54, is probably more applicable for simple buildings which aren't heat led or have complex systems. So things like light industrial units, retail units, uh, sheds, those kind of things are fairly easy to calculate, can be done with a basic model uh, and some post-processing using Excel. What's really important to understand is it's not using the MCM. So the MCM is National Calculation Methodology, is used in PARTEL and EPCs, uh, they're used as a compliance exercise. They're not supposed to be used for energy prediction. They throw out energy numbers, but they're based on standardised uh, occupancy performances, and they're really looking at energy efficiency. So they're saying 
how efficient is the light bulb you've put or light fitting you put in the building, not how many and how often you use it. Similarly for ventilation, it's not saying how big is the fan and how much and how many hours are you running it for? It's saying how efficient is it moving air? So it's not cannot be used as an indicator and it only covers uh, regulated energy loads rather than all building loads. So you really have to focus on these three or equivalent operational energy calculation methodologies. You can't use the building regulations to do so. Uh, what's really important though is uh, at the top of this, I've got the word enabled. Uh, these basically allow you to do calculations to predict what the energy is, but we're talking about net zero carbon in operation. And the only way to measure net zero carbon in operation is to actually use the metered energy performance of the building. So when we do the prediction, it's just a prediction. Uh, it, it now enables us to basically say on practical completion, we've done a calculation. We think the energy consumption is going to be this if you operate the building in that way. And that means we can claim the building is net zero carbon enabled. What it doesn't do is guarantee the energy performance and use. And the only way to look at the energy performance and use is getting that metered data. So the electricity bills, ideally not gas bills, we should be avoiding scope one emissions, as I said earlier, but getting those electricity bills, looking at the actual performance, comparing the energy intensity uh, against the model and seeing where the uh, performance actually lies. Uh, there's been a number of schemes launched recently to do this. Uh, the key one that we're seeing in the market at the moment is UK Neighbours, uh, which has come over from Australia, which was used over a decade to reduce uh, emissions from office buildings in Australia by 70%. It requires people to basically input their energy performance and then they get a star rating. So one star being the worst, six stars being market leading. In Australia, it's taken them a decade almost to get up to kind of five, five and a half star with the absolute market leaders at six stars. The UK is just starting that process at the moment, and there's a number of pioneering projects aiming around the kind of four or five star. There are a few that are considering six stars, but it's it's going to be a few years before the UK market gets there. But what's slightly different about the neighbours rating is it really only looks at the, the base building. So it looks at the uh, landlord systems rather than the occupier systems. So when we're talking about net zero carbon, we need to cover both the landlord and the tenant. Neighbours just focuses on that base build because that's what uh, a landlord can affect and monitor. But again, where investors and organisations are making the commitment, they're actually covering the scope three emissions associated with their tenants and occupiers. So that needs to be considered and reviewed, but uh, the neighbours only at the moment covers the uh, landlord performance. This kind of leads on to kind of interesting thing at the moment. We, I talked about those intensity targets earlier. Uh, which are basically that 55 number I was talking about, which is Paris proof and aligned. What the UK GBC and other organisations like uh, ROBA have done is they've brought out step trajectories, which basically say, this is where we currently are. Here's targets for the next five years, which in theory sounds like a great idea. So it's basically saying, as we improve designing net zero carbon buildings, uh, we can improve the way we do it. But if you go back to what I was talking about earlier and CREM and, and the asset performance, all those buildings that are built will eventually have to be net zero carbon. So if I build a building in 2027, which is net zero carbon to the 25 standard, it will be net zero carbon for three years and then it won't be. And again, we're being judged on the actual performance of that building. So whilst it's a good idea looking at the step trajectory to see where the market is, ultimately we should be aiming for the Paris proof and Paris aligned targets so we don't have to do retrofit works to the building. So for example, if I look at it on a crumb trajectory, if I build a new building which has a performance of uh, around about 30, it will have a stranding point after uh, about a decade. Whereas if I do a bit more work and make it a bit more energy efficient, the stranding point might come at the end of the plant after 20, 25 years where I can upgrade to better plant or systems in the building. What I don't want to be doing for a new building is having to reclad it within the first 10, 20 years of its life. So we really need to think about a fabric first approach, make sure that any insulation building fabric we're putting in is, is designed to be 2050 um, proof basically. And just to emphasize that we're doing quite a lot of projects at the moment where there's talk about a premium for net zero carbon uh, and generally it's considered to be kind of five to 15 percent uplift for net zero carbon and this is because it's new there's risk associated that will come down over time uh, and become the norm probably within the next five years so at the moment the forerunners are paying a premium for that 
But if you don't uh, do that work and you decide it, it's not cost effective to add that five to 10 percent onto the build cost, then what you're doing is basically you've, you've got a slightly higher running costs. But what's important is you're going to have to retrofit that building in order to meet the UK government's 2050 target. Uh, and that will have if you haven't got the fabric first, that will be significant cost, significantly more than the 10 to 15 percent. So, again, it reemphasizes the importance of getting that fabric first approach. Um, th th that's really new buildings uh, for existing buildings. We use the same process, so we do a lot of audits go into existing buildings, uh, compare it against those principles. So passive design, operational energy, removing fossil fuels to see how it scores against the net zero carbon requirements versus standard practice and make recommendations on how that can be improved. So, for example, going into a building which has gas boilers, we look at how we could potentially move that over to heat pumps. Does that mean we have to change terminal units and have to do uh, on floor measures as well? Um, the the easiest way to look at it again is on a trajectory. So what we do is we understand where the building is. So it could be at 220. It needs to get down to, to 55. It will have a net zero carbon pathway for that asset, which could be 2030 or 2050 uh, individually for those individual assets. What we're then able to do is build a digital twin. So we basically take the metered performance data put it into a model, try and calibrate that to be as closely performing to reality uh, as we can. And then we start modeling interventions. So changing the heating system, adding more insulation, uh, reducing glazing areas, all to see what impact that will have on the operational energy performance. We can then step those down towards the 55 and demonstrate that we're able to have a pathway to achieving that 55 for existing assets. Obviously, with existing assets, it's not simply just designing it. You obviously have to factor in leases, uh, vacancy period, void periods, uh, standard plant replacement, end of life. So normally for an asset, you'd look over kind of a decade or two decade at these interventions of when you apply them. Obviously, we would need to decarbonize as fast as possible, but sometimes that's not possible because of the, 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 the requirements on the asset, its leasing requirements and how it's being operated. But every asset should, in the near future, have a pathway to net zero carbon, how it plans to achieve the, these requirements. Uh, the other net zero carbon requirement is to do with embodied carbon, uh, often referred to as whole life carbon, but we're really focusing on the embodied part. Uh, and embodied carbon uh, is going to become more important as we go forward. Historically, operational energy has been uh, the larger proportion of an energy's footprint. But as we decarbonize the grid and reduce our energy consumption for energy efficiency, the importance of embodied carbon will go up. And most buildings which are built after 25 could be as high as 70, 80 percent of their emissions associated with the materials rather than their operational energy. And when we talk about uh, embodied carbon, we're generally talking cradle to grave. So the extraction of materials, process, transportation to site, site activity, that's all known as the upfront embodied carbon. So that can be fairly accurately calculated now and reported on practical completion for any building uh, with, a, with a reasonable degree of certainty. Over the last kind of four or five years, the accuracy has really improved. We also don't just stop there. We want to understand what the in-use carbon is. So looking at the operation, repair, maintenance, fit out, uh, Every eight year that should be reviewed and reported and uh, then at the end of life, understanding the demolition of that building and hopefully reusing a circular economy of those products. But again, it's more difficult to calculate the whole life carbon because of material decarbonisation, grid decarbonisation. Uh, we should be calculating it and making decisions based on whole life carbon, but most of the targets are around this upfront embodied carbon. And again, on the IPC PCC report, we need to act now so the carbon that we're using today is the important carbon rather than carbon in the future. Uh, RICS uh, and the construction industry have really defined that into a number of modules which we call A1 to A5 which is the upfront embodied carbon associated with the construction of a building, the B modules B1 to 5 which is the materials in use, B6 which is operational energy which we've been through before and then the C modules which is the end of life and disposal of a building. They can all be calculated during the design process and predicted with reasonable degrees of accuracy. 
So again, there's a definition for what is a net zero carbon upfront embodied carbon. So it's defined where all greenhouse grass emissions, uh, excluding sequestration, uh, are minimalized, meet local intensity targets and are offset to zero. So it's a requirement to meet the target, then offset to zero. There's a lot of confusion at the moment in the market with a lot of people thinking you do as best as you can and then offset to the target. That's not the case. You have to hit the target first in order to be net zero carbon. So you hit the target, then offset. If you don't hit the target, you can still offset the carbon footprint, but you'd only be classified as carbon neutral, as I showed earlier. You have to hit the target to be net zero carbon. Uh, we wrote recently or worked with the GLA to define their approach to uh, whole life carbon assessments. And as part of that, we reviewed a number of buildings which had been built, which had done whole life carbon assessments and upfront embodied carbon calculations. And we saw that the average for most new buildings, uh, reasonable uh, number of stories, kind of five stories plus, was over a thousand kilograms of CO2 per meter squared. Uh, you can compare that against the Letty benchmark targets, which Letty have set 2020 targets of 600 and 2030 targets of 350. And you can see that pretty much no buildings are kind of achieving that in the current market. The GLA have set a benchmark recommendation at below 900, which we'd like it to be slightly lower, kind of kind of towards 800 or 700, uh, which is achievable now with good traditional build. So cement replacement, uh, recycled steel, you can get down to kind of 600, 700. Timber can take you slightly lower, but what I, what I mentioned in the last bit is when you're taking timber into account, Timber is really good on whole life carbon, but it isn't as strong on upfront embodied carbon because we don't take sequestration into account. So sequestration is the wood, the, the carbon that's absorbed during the process of the tree growing. I'm not going to go through the details of that because I probably could speak about four hours on that and it's a huge debate. I'll, I'll, I'll touch on it towards the end. But at the moment, the standards do not include sequestration in the upfront embodied carbon calculation. So timber can get you slightly lower than the traditional builds, kind of from 700 down to kind of 600 or maybe 550, but it doesn't give you the full benefit. The full benefits included in the whole life carbon assessment uh, and needs to be calculated and reviewed, but it doesn't give you that upfront saving. The only buildings which are getting down below kind of the Letty 2020 target towards the 2030 targets are ones which are having significant retrofit and refurbishment retained facades or ideally retained structural elements. Uh, Letty and uh, the Reburned iStruct T recently reviewed the targets for embodied carbon and uh, uh, brought out a new banding system. So this banding system both looks at upfront embodied carbon and uh, whole life carbon uh, of a building, and they basically have set new kind of targets similar to EPC uh, bandings A, B, C, D, with the best performing buildings, new buildings generally coming in around about the C, with refurbishments coming in close to the kind of A still very difficult to kind of get up to that a plus that's where we're looking to go in the near future uh, and the reason retrofit is really being pushed and preferred is uh, generally for most uh, multi-story buildings you're looking at 50 percent of the carbon footprint uh, being associated with the structure upper floors um, and uh, frame of the building so if you're able to reuse any structure you can basically half that uh, embodied carbon What's really important is understanding how you calculate it, and there are a number of tools out there. So there's uh, a number of proprietary software tools that are available. What's really important is if you're doing a lot of assessments as a developer is to get your consultant teams to use the same tool because there are slight variations in the results of these tools. So if you want to compare two projects, you really need to be using kind of the same software. They've all significantly improved over the last few years, but they still need a little bit of uh, tweaking and refinement to get them in alignment with the newest standards. Uh, and we recommend that if you're if you're doing multiple assessments, the only way of really comparing them is um, getting them done on the same proprietary piece of software and also getting third party verification because again there's very limited number of people who are proficient at these tools at the moment uh, a lot of people are using them uh, but it's worth getting third party verification on the performance and what was interesting earlier uh, towards the end of last year was SIBSI actually published uh, guidance for calculating body carbon and building services so in body carbon for new buildings 
uh, structures have really moved on in the last kind of five or six years. The accuracy of the calculations is really good. Uh, architects are really looking strongly at facades and uh, facade performances and, and, and ratings. Still needs a bit of work in terms of accuracy, but where the most inaccuracy is generally associated with building services, they can account for up to kind of 15% of the embodied carbon of a new building. They have fairly long, complicated supply chains uh, and SIBSI's now put together documentation to try and help bridge that gap. Most LCA calculations just choose a factor for building services rather than looking at the actual performance. So we need to start calculating and getting that data for all types of materials and products that are used in a building going forward. So just some of the key considerations though when, when looking at embodied carbon. So one of the key things that use uh, carbon in a build, new building is basements. So basements generally are very carbon heavy because they're very concrete heavy. Uh, uh, so if you can reduce the size of basements or even better design them out, that can generally get you 100 to 150 kilograms of CO2 per meter squared uh, savings. Uh, grid sizes for structures is really important. Where we've gone long span, they're generally adding more material and more weight and more carbon. If we can get standardised grids, smaller grids, then we are making, able to make them more efficient and have less carbon associated with them. One of the biggest debates at the moment is always steel, concrete versus timber. All of them can be good, all of them can be bad. They all have their pros and cons associated with them. Timber is, is, is the better way, but it's understanding where to use that timber uh, and where it's best uh, best benefit for the usage of timber. But the simple things are, if, you, if, you're, if you're specifying concrete, look at some cement replacements. It's very easy to get up to kind of uh, 40, 50, even sometimes 60 percent cement replacements. Generally, that can add cost savings. There is scarcity of supplies at the moment, and going forward, they'll probably get even more scarce, which enables recycled steel and steel to actually improve. So steel at the moment is generally fairly poor performing, but there's more uh, arc fired furnaces coming online and more access to recycled steel are going to come in the future. So steel has a, has a place. Timber is great. We, we love timber buildings and we, we should be looking at them, but it's understanding the appropriate use with fire concerns and insurance concerns. Smaller bespoke buildings are definitely uh, best place for timber. Some of the larger buildings, it, it can be made to work, but it's more difficult and doesn't always give you the carbon savings. And I'm not going to get into a discussion on sequestration now because, again, as, as I said, it could take hours, but uh, it's worth calculating the with and without sequestration uh, benefits of carbon uh, before you and, and use both sets of results to inform your decision making. But the key kind of final message though is uh, what we're really starting to do with a lot of local authorities and planning authorities, which was never done before, was look at retrofit first. So whenever looking at any site appraisal is understanding the carbon value of a, an, an asset there. Can we retain the can we retain the um, the structure? Can we retain any facades? Can we optimize what we've got? Can we add uh, additional floors on whilst maintaining the, the structure? So it's buildings should have to go through the process of understanding and, and are more being required to go through the process of understanding the value as part of the planning process before you come to the decision that you need a new building. Uh, obviously, one of the big barriers for that at the moment is the tax. So obviously, new building has no VAT, whereas existing buildings has a 20% premium. So that generally pushes a lot of people towards new building. Uh, and hopefully the government are looking at that at the moment. There's a number of consultations underway to look at the potential of leveling up the VAT for new and existing works. So that was kind of a whistle stop store of uh, operational energy and embodied carbon. If you've got any questions, uh, we can go through those now. Well done, Simon. That was absolutely brilliant, sir. It was highly informative and highly entertaining. And I've got to say, we've got some really good questions coming in. Really good. So, um, well done, Simon. It's just it's the first one from, and I, if I do apologise in advance if I do not pronounce your name correctly, uh, Ignacio Diaz Morato. Um, and he says here, um, the man is from Foster and Partners. First good. His question for Simon is this What is the most common? stroke most appropriate modeling system for operational energy in complex uh, typologies such as database centers any equivalent uh, to passive house for residential what a wonderful question from ignacio yeah, it's, it's a really good question. Um, uh, as I outlined, when, we, when we're starting to get into advanced HVAC solutions where the fan energy and cooling energy 
is generally over kind of 40 50 percent of the energy consumption of a building it is much more appropriate to move away from passive house because we're not uh, we're not as concerned about conserving the heat and we're more focused about the efficiency of the systems don't get me wrong you should still be looking to insulate and and get the buildings airtight but we don't need to go to the nth degree that passive house does uh the the best thing uh generally is design for performance uh, which is the link to the uk neighbor scheme so that is at the moment for commercial offices but you can use the principles for anything so you can use ies uh, tas all have um hevac uh, modules where you basically input the actual performance parameters of the equipment so if you have a chiller instead of just putting the seasonal performance in you put the performance at 10 percent 20 percent 30 percent you put the curve in so when you run the simulation it looks at the efficiency at every hour and understands the performance so you can get chillers which are very good at lower load you can get chillers which are very good at high load uh, and poor in the other respects so what you need to be doing is trying to optimize the performance and that's where controls and commissioning really come in so once you've once you've set up a decent HVAC model using IES or TAS systems, uh, then you can you can fine tune that. And with data centers, it's it's generally going to really be around um, uh, your cooling systems and how to optimize that. So at Cundal, we've done quite a lot of major data centers, and we actually we do quite a lot of free cooling systems. So what we want to model is the changeover points for free cooling, how we optimize free cooling, how we can uh, use ventilation only rather than use cooling uh, and basically optimize the performance. And then once we've done that detailed modeling, we can put that into our controls and commissioning strategy and make sure that's played out because you can have a really great and efficient piece of equipment, but if you control it badly, it's not going to perform as you want. And that's why controls is, is one of the best ones to, to focus on in order to get the reductions. Wonderful answer. I mean, brilliant. That's very detailed. Very grateful for that. That's excellent. Luke, Luke Turner has asked a question, sir. Is the COP in Glasgow likely to change stroke lower stroke modify the 1.5 Paris target? Uh, it won't change the target. The target is appropriate and right. So 1.5 degrees. Well, we'd ideally like to stop it now, but we know there's inherent uh, increase is already built into the environment with the emissions we're producing now. So 1.5 is very aspirational and it will be amazing if we can get to 1.5 degrees. What COP26 will do, it will reset the pledges. So when COP21 was done five, well, six years ago now, all the governments went away and worked out their carbon footprint and worked out their reduction strategies. And if you add all those reduction strategies together, they come to about 3.3 degrees, which is significantly above the two degrees minimum, 1.5 degrees aspirational target. What COP26 is going to do later this year is hopefully see those governments come back with new targets. And those targets will hopefully be closely uh, closer aligned to uh, below two degrees. We're expecting them to be hopefully below two degrees, as I say, they're not likely to be close to 1.5 degrees. Hopefully they do, but uh, I'd be very surprised if they do. And, and what's interesting is understanding the speed. So obviously the UK government has set a target to be net zero carbon by 2050, but that alone won't align us to a 1.5 to G trajectory. So what we saw actually a few months ago is the government come out and say, I'll get the number wrong now, uh, they would reduce carbon emissions in the UK by 78% by 2030. And that is to align us to the trajectory for 1.5 degrees. So we need to cut fast it's not a case of cutting evenly for the next 30 years or waiting for 30 years and doing everything in 2048 we need to be cutting carbon at a consistently uh well we need to cut carbon fast now with a reduced rate going forward it needs to come now because we are in that emergency and if you see the ipc reports over the last couple of days it's it's very alarming where we actually are and all the projections have been underestimates of where where we're going to get to Okay, that's a wonderful answer. Well done, Simon. Hopefully, Luke will be happy with that. I'm sure everybody else is. Um, now, this is Bill, Bill Prince of Galliford Tri. Thank you, Bill. Hi, Simon. Do you have a definition for net zero ready? This is being used for some new build projects. Yeah, it's similar to the enabled. So ready is the wording the UK GBC used. Uh, when the Whole Life Carbon Network and Letty reviewed it, we, we, we've gone to enabled as the wording. So that's basically, as I said, you, you've, you've basically designed the building so it can operate uh, uh, at net zero carbon, but you haven't got any operational data. 
because the problem with a lot of modeling and data so if you take commercial offices for example over 50 percent of the energy will be down to the tenants so that would be the tenant lighting uh small power computer usage and if you don't if it's speculative you have to make assumptions on who's going to use it if it's an end user they're still making guesstimates like we're working with a lot of uh, tenants at the moment they've got no idea how they're going to use the buildings post covid so we're, we're guesstimating how they're going to operate it we do the calculations based on those estimates and say if you operate it in this way it will be net zero carbon in operation so it's net zero carbon enabled already uh but the final verification has to come with that metered data uh it's even more important i'm doing quite a few portfolios looking at light industrial think about light industrial you could have a storage unit going uh, to one unit which doesn't have any heating it's just got storage very small process load you've got another building which is going to have a shadow kitchen in it which is going to be using huge amounts of energy is it fair that they have the same targets so again it's looking at the building and saying is the building able to to um, facilitate a net zero carbon operation under standard conditions you need to clarify those definitions uh, we'll see more clarification over the next year i suppose we've seen quite a lot of over the last six months uh, the whole life carbon network has had funding from government to to look at some of this uh, and bring out some more definitions uh, over the next kind of year uh, and there's a government select committee at the moment reviewing that which the whole life carbon network is feeding into so hopefully that consistency and definitions are coming and there might even be certification which the uk green building council are looking at so we can all be on the same page because at the moment there is a lot of people saying certain things and it's not always aligned excellent again thank you sir uh, hopefully bill that's just uh, the, the answer you were seeking i've got i'm just gonna have to uh, dash over there was uh, luke asked another question but um come back to that possibly luke richard saxon has written in <laughs> and said surely the impact of embodied carbon comes all at once compared to operational loads uh, net present value should emphasize the embodied embodied cost do you not think hopefully that will make sense good question richard yeah it, it definitely does and it's, 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 it's one of the interesting things in the industry at the moment so embodied carbon isn't just the upfront so you've got a125 which is the upfront you should be reporting every year the repair maintenance and that can still be a significant bit especially if you've got shop if you think about a shop unit the embodied carbon is significant but every every kind of five years it's refitted which has a huge carbon footprint as well so that needs to be reported but as I said, the upfront embodied carbon for most new developments will be could be up as high as 70, 80 percent for most developments. So it, it should be the key focus, but it's not. And the reason it's not the key focus is because the operational energy, all the developers, landlords know that they're going to be judged on this ongoing indefinitely. They need their buildings to be net zero carbon by 2050. So they need a strategy to do that. Embodied carbon, they've all set targets for but there's be but the problem is once you build the building that knows that embodied carbon is is kind of forgotten about two years later because it's been used so it is the, it should be the focus and that's why we need regulation and requirements for getting in planning we need to get it into building regulations or equivalents so it, it picks up the bottom of the market it should absolutely be the focus and most developers and funds are looking at it but they're not looking at it with the same intensity because it's a one-off analysis which at the moment they're not being picked up whereas they know they're going to be picked up using CREM, TCFD uh, and Task Force for Climate Related Disclosure in the near future and they need to get the operational side sorted quicker. That's why we need the regulation and there was a really strong movement recently on getting that Part Z introduced for embodied carbon. So if you can go on there and sign up for the regulation of embodied carbon that would be appreciated. Well done, sir. Thank you for that. Well done. Great, great answer. Bloody good question as well. Ian Farmer's written in. Ian has said uh, the standing graph didn't hit zero uh, by 2050. Is this recognition uh, from TCFD that absolute zero is not possible currently for the built environment? Slightly contentious. What do you think? Well, yeah, uh, well, that, that that graph is interesting. That, that's from CREM, so it's not TCFD. TCFD don't have detail, uh, and, and I think people like CREM are trying to fill it. What's interesting with CREM is they've got two, uh, they do it with both carbon and energy. So the energy obviously never gets, you don't, you're not going to get your energy to zero. Uh, you're still going to be, we're still going to be using, they actually go lower than Letty and UK GBC. Uh, in terms of emissions, I expect you will 
always have a mission. So it's quite interesting. I do quite a lot of advice to organizations as well as the built environment. And where we talk about an organization, we always assume that you'll have a residual carbon footprint associated with your scope three. Because if you think scope one is your direct fossil fuel burn, you should be removing that. That We need to get rid of that by 2050 or earlier if possible. So that's gas boilers, uh, petrol vehicles. Scope two is your electricity. Uh, generally, there are other things, but it's mostly your electricity use. Grid is decarbonizing and we'll move to zero before 2050, as long as we hit our intensity targets and, and energy performance. And you can uh, accelerate that by purchasing green energy, as long as it adds additionality and is truly really green energy. So those two should go, you should get those to zero. But your scope three emissions will, will probably never, well, it's unlikely they get to, to absolute zero. You will always have some carbon associated in, with purchase goods and services, materials, or at least for the foreseeable future. So we don't have to get to absolute zero in order to align with the Paris Agreement. There's a carbon budget which we, we can spend going forward. We just need to basically get down to that carbon budget as, as, as quick as possible. And that's where offsets come in at the moment. So if everyone tried to offset their carbon emissions now, there isn't enough. But if we if we reduce our carbon footprint by 80, 90 percent as, as a global community, then there's enough to offset that residual emission. So there will always be a case for you won't be able to always get down to zero and there will be a place for offsetting. But that offset should always be the last resort once you've done absolutely everything else. That's excellent. Uh, hopefully, uh, Ian Farm would agree. But anyway, I'm sure everybody else does. That was a great answer, So, um, Great answer. This will probably be the last question, and this is from Rob. Thank you for writing in, Rob. How optimistic is Simon that the industry will cut carbon fast? Leading question. <laughs> it's a very leading question. It, it's a very difficult one. Um, I've been in sustainability for over two decades, uh, and most of that has been tick box sustainability or lip service uh, sustainability has definitely moved up everyone's agenda uh, and there's real interest in achieving it setting targets people are setting uh, policy people are setting commitments uh, but what we need is action uh, we've seen a lot of people come out with commitments but there's been very little action and even in design teams uh, that are targeting net zero carbon it's yes that would be nice to do but we need to get on with reality so there's there is hesitancy and a bit of a, a delay in 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 what we're doing at the moment uh, i believe that we will uh, get down to the intensity in carbon figures but it's not going to be easy. There's a lot of, as I said, the leading properties at the moment, uh, developers are looking kind of at five uh, star neighbors, five and a half star. But in reality, once they get the verification, they're gonna probably be closer to four, maybe even three and a half star. It's gonna take a while to get there. And we need to act fast in order to respond to the IPCC report and actually get these carbon footprints down. So we need to challenge the mindset. It needs to be front and center of what we do and where we end up yeah, it, it could. It, hopefully it's below two degrees and as close to 1.5 degrees as possible. Uh, it's great, great stuff. So, so I'm so sorry we can't ask you any more questions. Uh, you've been absolutely brilliant. If you just hold uh, on for a minute before we as we wrap up. But thank you so much. I'm going to come back in a second. Uh, thanks to everybody for such excellent questions. We are extremely grateful. Just two particularly important notices before we close out this evening's session. Number one, please. Our next event is Tuesday. 14th of September starting at 6 p.m. and full details of this event will be released on Friday the 13th of August. Number two, please would you be willing to respond to Arne Kelly's uh, email that we're with you first thing in the morning on feedback from this evening's event which I'm sure will be brilliant Simon. We do everything we can to use your comments to continually improve our product and service to meet your needs. We should be immensely grateful if you would provide this feedback for us please. Many thanks in advance. So to round up, huge and incredible uh, thanks to the hard working London Construction Excellence uh, Management Team, uh, the large S and technical registry of the team at Syed who co-produced this evening's event, plus your very good sales, everybody, for participating this evening. And many, many thanks once again to our wonderful guest speaker, Simon. Simon, thank you so much. That was brilliant, sir. Really, really grateful, Simon. Thank you so much. Good night, everyone. Look forward to interacting with you all again in four weeks' time. Good night, everybody. <laughs>